Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison, former NFL player, now climbing the seven summits, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Okay, look, seven, eight years ago, I had to step into the fear and put a big-ass goal out there, and so I decided to start climbing all these crazy mountains around the world. It's been an absolute amazing journey. And, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I've actually done six of the seven. I've actually been on Denali twice. I've been on uh, Climb Successfully, Kilimanjaro twice. But now it's Mount Everest, the biggest boy on the block, 29,000 plus. And I'm headed over there April 2020, and I'm totally keyed up. And I'm keyed up because I've been doing all this preparation. I, I train like an absolute bear. And... Um, really putting myself in a position of success. I'm going to be climbing with one of the top climbing outfitters in the world. Excited about that. And uh, just the mountain has fascinated me for years, I'm sure, like others, but uh, really excited to do so. And so if I can actually pull this thing off, I'd be the first NFL player to do so. And so as we speak today, there's not that many first in the world. So uh, I look forward to tackling that. Okay, so that's one. Two is I totally appreciate the lesson on these different podcasts. I really do. And uh, it's been an amazing journey, as I said, from um, not just interviewing these people, but being on the other side of the, the the mic and really taking in their incredible stories of doing amazing things. And look, we all need to be inspired. And so if I can help provide and find more people that meet that criteria, all the better. And uh, it just, we all need that that uh, that motivation. And we all need that those words of encouragement that you can make it back relevant to your own situation and then plow forward in whatever endeavor you are trying to do. Okay, so I appreciate that. And uh, if you want to find out anything that I have going on, you can do so at markpattisonnfl.com. I've got a book out now called Finding Your Summit, Go Figure. And it is essentially the playbook to uh, what I had learned from my Hall of Fame coaches on how to emerge and do some great things in your life. It doesn't have to be mountain climbing, of course. It can be anything, but it's 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 a plug-in that you 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 take on these different these different things, these different goals, that these different strategies that that I've set forth, uh, that they set forth for me, and good things can come from that. Okay. Also on the website, you can find out more about my expedition. Obviously, I'm be going to I'll be going to to Mount Everest, and we'll have more information about that coming up. There's an e-learning course and, of course, the podcast. And when you go to the podcast, you will find an iTunes tab. And I would be so grateful if you go in and you'd rate and review. Now, it all has to do with visibility, popularity of podcasts, because there's so many podcasts out there today that it's so easy to get lost and like, wait, where's Finding Your Summit? And uh, I think I really do believe these stories are, are really amazing and, and incredible and can really give a lift to those people who really need it. And even if you don't, we all need to be motivated and, and uh, inspired by other people to keep going. So if you'd go in and do that, I would be really, really appreciative. Okay, so look at, let's go listen to the pod. It's going to be awesome. Here we go. Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison. I am back with aggression and very jacked up because today I've got one of my idols I've had for a long time. This is a guy I met back in 1979 when I was being recruited by a number of different colleges around the country. California was the place that this alumni was and is from and uh, just had the great fortune to be invited up to his house. Uh, later would become a super agent. There was a movie that was essentially made after him. And uh, Lee has been at literally the top of the mountaintop, uh, Mount Everest of, of being in the sports agency business. Uh, he's been down and now he's back and he's back and better than ever. So, so excited to be here with Lee Steinberg, super agent to many of the NFL superstars around the league for all the different years. So first of all, Lee, Thanks for joining the pod. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to have you. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I, I, I want to go back. And so it was hard for me. I, I do always remember that moment in time. I think they call it Strawberry Canyon. And I had, had a probably the best recruiting trip of all the recruiting trips. The Huskies was probably the worst where I ended up going. <laughs> and uh, I went down, hung out with a lot of the different players, loved the university. And, and then afterwards, you had a connection with uh, the athletic department. And so I went up to your house at the time, overlooked the stadium, 
overlooked the city, the bay, and it was just incredible. And and at that time, I think you you had Warren Moon, who a lot of people, um, if they they now remember him being an NFL star, but in those days after coming <coughs> off the Rose Bowl. And I think he, he might have been the MVP. Rather than go to the NFL, he didn't make that path. And so he had to go to the CFL, the Canadian Football League. So what was that like starting off with Warren Moon? I mean, it, it would become a great relationship with you two, but what was that like? So at the time, Warren was MVP of the Rose Bowl and a really talented uh, quarterback from the University of Washington. He aspired to be a quarterback, but at that time in the NFL, the so-called thinking positions, which were center, quarterback, safety, were thought by many in the NFL fraternity to be uh, not a great launching pad for African-American athletes. So it wasn't universal, but many people held that feeling, and there hadn't been many great african-american or black quarterbacks so warren wanted to play and he would have been drafted in the nfl but before that ever happened we went ahead and signed in the canadian football league they had a coach hugh campbell that was wonderful warren thought it'd be a learning experience and he could prove himself and then come back to the nfl so he spent six years in edmonton and wasn't even the starter and was mvp (laughs) And uh, they had another starter who would go in for a couple series and then Warren would replace him. And what it set up was a dynamic in 1984 where there was a USFL that was competing heavily with the NFL. There was the Canadian Football League. There was the NFL. And he was the first pure free agent. There wasn't free agency in the NFL then. Every contract gave the team a right to pay 10% more and keep that player in perpetuity. So Warren was a novelty because the most critical position quarterback, and here he's in his prime, and we took a tour of uh, the United States to about eight or nine different franchises. Uh, It was very competitive, and at the end he signed with the biggest contract yet for an NFL player with uh, the... uh, Houston Oilers, right? With the then Houston Oilers. And he ended up playing 23 years, uh, six in the NFL and 17, six in the CFL and 17 in the NFL. And we sort of grew up together. It was, uh, we went through life together and and became best friends and <clears throat> probably the biggest honor I've had doing this was to be his presenter at the Pro Football Hall of Fame and to be the first person for my profession to really go ahead and, and play that role and it was a, a monumental achievement by by him and and uh, I was so honored so let's go back just a little bit because I think this all ties in right and I'm going to bounce around a little bit because your career is is fascinating to me uh, one of my favorite movies of all time just because I have so many connections to it I did go into the combines I was over at Arizona State I had every agent crawling around the top 350 players from around the country um, who were there going through all the exercises and everything else. Jerry Maguire, of course, Tom Cruise played essentially your role in that whole movie. But when I, when I dial it back, something that was really interesting to me is you grew up in, in Southern California, and you end up going one year to UCLA, right? And then for some reason, and I want to understand this thinking a little bit more, but you, you end up transferring up to Cal, Right. And I think that really had a defining moment in terms of your growth and the way you your leadership and everything else that would play out. Why did you want to transfer from one great university to, to, uh, you know, I mean, they're they're neck and neck. But Cal is amazing place, too. My parents had five degrees between them from UCLA, Mm -hmm. and my father had actually played basketball and golf there. I was brought up a Bruin baby. I went to the Coliseum and watched the football team. I went to the Venice High Gym and watched the basketball team. So there's no question I was going to UCLA. But And I loved my year there, and I'd been very happy. However, it was the late 60s, and the counterculture was coming, and it was long hair and tie-dye and rock music and Vietnam War protest and 
a, a whole raising of consciousness. And the center of student life in the United States at that point, the cutting edge, was Berkeley. Yeah. And so I took a trip up for All Cal Weekend, and somebody put uh, s- heads, uh, headphones on, on me and cranked up Light My Fire with Jim Morrison yeah. in the doors, and I knew I had to go to Berkeley. <laughs> and, uh, so it was a different experience. I'd been raised by parents who emphasized two values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family. Are you a good son? Are you a good father? Are you a good to your friends uh, there at critical times when they really need you. And the second was to make a difference in the world. So I was always judged by, did I help people who couldn't help themselves? Did I understand my obligation to make a difference in the world? And my father would look at me and he would say, you know, when there's a big problem in the world or a minor problem, such as picking something up off the floor or a bigger problem such as uh, racism or, or uh, uh, climate change and you keep looking for they or them to solve the problem the amorphous they older people, political figures he would look at me and say you could wait forever the they is you son mm-hmm. you are the they So it imbued me with a sense of responsibility that I had to try and hone my skills to to make a difference in the world and to right wrongs. And so Berkeley was fit with that. And then I ended up student body president there at the time that Ronald Reagan was governor who later became president, and I learned everything I needed to learn about negotiating from dealing with Governor Reagan. Every time we demonstrated, he called in the police, he called in the National Guard, and we then uh, would have to negotiate with him over what was happening. So um, it was a unique experience. And when I was student body president, Berkeley was the concentric vortex of of student life. So people like Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison or Gloria Steinem would come to my office and I'd tour them around Berkeley. Amazing. So it was not uncommon to see major political figures, uh, you know, the Timothy Learys of the world, the the rock music mavens, the Janis Joplins and, and Eric Clapton's would all come by and visit. And so it was a heady experience. Yeah, I bet. Well, first of all, a bunch of things to unpack there. Number one, your parents being great mentors to you, really showing you the path of what life is about, right? Um, you're talking about being a stand-up person. You're talking about paying it forward. You're talking about social responsibility. Number two is, uh, and, and again, this is back in the late 60s. Um, I get up there in 1979 for my recruiting trip, and I'll never forget that I had heard from other people. Now, it's a different time, of course, but I had heard from different people like, hey, whatever you do, you got to go see this 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 avenue called Telegraph Avenue, <laughs> right? And all these crazy yeah. people are down exactly. there. And so uh, the, the these, these, uh, these California there were gals mostly i believe that were showing us around campus i went to them i said hey i'd like to go down and check out the university life and 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 they go no we can't take you down there and i go finally i go well i I, if i'm coming here i'm going to telegraph avenue and they go look we were told by the coaches not to take any (laughs) players down there because they had the bubble man the balloon man and you know all these crazy characters down there but i think it was really an extension of the time that you were there um at that time Another thing that, that, that I learned in, in, in you know, kind of a, a two-part is, one, you were voted uh, most likely to succeed in your high school class. I had another um, buddy that was close with in my high school at Roosevelt, Hans Schmidt, and he was voted in the same way. And, you know, to, to, to get that honor is really something I, I believe that is bestowed upon the reputation that you have because you have all the qualities, you have all the characteristics of somebody who can do great things in life. But interesting enough, um, you also go on to to start the Unity Party. Is that right? So was that just an extension again of what this this whole social conscious that you're talking about and being involved in, in student government? So I had I had been student body president in my junior high, high school. Uh, went on to be a student senator and then student body president at. Uh, at Cal, and then president of my class at at Bolt at law school, and it so much in life is listening. 
the essential skill that I think is most important is being able to look at another person and peel back the layers of the onion so that instead of talking on the surface, you're able to, to draw out another human being so that you get to their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. And you get them to lay out what priorities in life are critical to you short-term economic gain, long-term economic security, geographical location, spiritual values, family, making an impact in the world. For an athlete, it's endorsements, uh, it's being on a winning team, the quality of coaching, the uh, system that they play. So the point always was, when I was a student, was to be able to put myself in the heart and mind of another human being and see the world the way they saw it. And that would allow you to navigate through life gracefully because you'd really have deeper relationships and based on who truly someone was. And so you could bond with them uh, on a deeper level. I think that's that's easy to say and hard to do, and I, I mean that because not that that you aren't that way, and there's no question you are that way. You're a very authentic person. You can you can feel this genuine, I don't know, authentic way about yourself. But I think when you know you were in, you know, you're uh, you're 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. I think it's a hard place for many people because you're kind of in that me 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 phase. You know, it's just about what time am I going to bed? What's the next party? Where's the hot girl next door? You know, it's just more about those things that dominate your mind about where I'm going. I think it takes an extra level and layer of complexity and maturity to be projecting in in what the other person might be going through, and really seeing that. Where you know, most people when they get older, they start to really understand that compassion you know gene a little bit more than when you're kind of in the the throes you know my i've got a daughter that just graduated from usc and another one that was chirping over here over at arizona right now and and you know as i I can see the difference between the two of ones as she's getting out is being more conscientious about others versus the one that's there right now it's just you know where's the next party And, and that's just the way that is so it's just you know it's it's a it's a you know, a tribute to you that you would be able to be thinking about that at such a, a young age. Well, I was trained that way, frankly, by my parents. And then the experiences I had generally being the leader meant that it wasn't about me. It was about whatever the ultimate goal was. <clears throat> and it was being able to tune in to the people around me and understand how to lead in a collaborative way. And that meant that... And I understood really early at life that all that will have mattered at the end of the day is the relationships and whether I made a difference in the world. And anything external was ephemeral. Newspaper clippings would fade. Uh, reputation might fade. Different, everything material would fade. And you'd be left with these basic values. But having been in a position of leadership over and over and over again, I understood that the key to leading was tuning into the people around me and understanding what their needs were. And uh, so it's the opposite of self-absorption. Yeah. And my dad also told us that you could walk up to basically anybody in the world and the president of the United States, and if you were respectful and courteous, they'd probably be interested in what you had to say. So it gave us, my brothers and I, both of whom have been really impactful, the ability to feel at home on center stage. So I'm trying to understand. So you later go on and you graduate from Cal. You get your law degree as well. And and now I'm trying to understand the connection between you know, where do I do with my law degree in one hand? In the other hand, it's just like, I've got this connection that I want to be go become an agent. Now, at that time, you didn't know you'd blow up like the way you ultimately did in terms of being, you know, the, the superstar agent. But where was that connection piece for you that really did somebody ask you or did you see an opportunity? What was that? There was no field to aspire to in sports agentry. Right. The, 
reality was that teams had the right to not talk to agents. And so in those early years, they could just slam down the phone. There was no guaranteed right of representation. And so someone like Mike Brown of the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, when I called him up with a, a player, Pat McAnally, said, I don't have to deal with you, slam. Hmm. So there was nothing to aspire to. My goals were to either be involved in, in politics and, and social change somehow, or <clears throat> I had offers as a TV news person. I had, and then a whole series of offers in litigation. So if I was going to go into law, I would probably be a DA or a P public defender. So I had an offer in that and a number of others. I got waylaid along the way because I traveled the world. And when I got to Egypt, I thought it would be a great idea. I was out with a family on the Nile River and uh, the kids were jumping in. So I jumped in only to find later that there were multiple diseases endemic to the banks of the mm. Nile River. So I got real sick was in the hospital in uh, London for six weeks with, uh, you know, tropical disease. And when I came back, I couldn't work, so I couldn't take the jobs. And at that point, S Steve Bartkowski was drafted in January. They had the draft in January then of 1975. And he had had another agent, but he wasn't happy, and he asked me to represent him. So there I was brimming with legal experience. So... I wasn't sure when I did the Bartkowski negotiation that this was going to be a career, but I had a epiphany when we landed in Atlanta. We got the he was the first player picked overall in a draft, and we got the largest rookie contract of all time. So we get to Atlanta, and there are clean lights flashing in the sky, like for a movie premiere. When we get to the airport, and the first thing we hear is. Uh, uh, an interviewer says, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. Wow. And I saw that athletes were the celebrities, that athletes were the venerated figures in communities across the country. Much harder to see in California, much infinitely harder to see in Berkeley. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I could use the profile, the high profile of these athletes to make a meaningful impact in the world, that they could trigger imitative behavior. And I also saw the opportunity that if an athlete would retrace his roots to the high school community that helped shape him, set up a scholarship fund, do, uh, work with the Boys and Girls Club, and then go to the college where the alums relate primarily to the uh, to the football or basketball team at a school, and and do s s set up a scholarship fund like Troy Aikman did, or or retrofit the uh, uh, physical plant that they could stay bonded to those alums, and they'd have this whole series of mentors in their life. So it would lay the genesis for second career, and then at the pro level. I asked the athletes to uh, set up a charitable foundation that would have the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders so they would be with the movers and shakers in that city, and they would hone their skills in non-athletic ways, and they would also set the foundation for second career. So a, a Duran Cherry, a safety from Kansas City, yeah. has the Cherry Foundation, then he ends up uh, owning the Anheuser-Busch distributorship, uh, which in Missouri, Bud Beer is a license to print money. Uh, and then I introduced him to Wayne Weaver, and he became the first retired athlete to actually be an owner of a team, um, a minority owner, uh, as Ray Childers did with the Houston Texans and Wark Dunn did with uh, the Atlanta Falcons. And I, I saw then that you could, could ask an athlete who was playing for the 49ers with their training camp in Santa Clara, can you think of any 
interesting businesses proximate to your training facility. Well, they just had Silicon Valley yeah. and venture capital. So Brent Jones networks that uh, retired tight end of the 49ers and ends up with a $3 billion hedge fund. Yeah. Uh, Steve Young buys and sells, you know, uh, companies with a hedge fund and, and both of them do broadcast. Yeah. So I saw the path uh, and thought I could make an impact in young people's lives. And, um, we could set up programs. The first one was Rolf Benerska's Kicks for Critters, which saved endangered species uh, through research at the San Diego Zoo. And that was a poster pledge card program, which is the genesis for every time you walk into a stadium and you see that if an athlete does X, Y, or Z on the field, the business pledges a certain amount of money. So there were posters and pledge cards all throughout the neighborhood. Um, or Warwick Dunn, who just put the 175th single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own by his program Homes for the Holidays, uh, where he uh, makes a down payment on the home and moves the family in and outfits the home. Well, great examples. And through my research, you've had the most amount of number one overall NFL draft picks eight times. You've had 61st rounders. Uh, you've represented uh, guys in football, ba basketball, baseball, boxing, Olympic sports. Um, it's really been amazing. But the most amazing thing is the thing that you were just talking about is really, again, paying it forward. And that paying that forward is that through this collection of all these athletes, over 300 guys that you've represented over time, um, I think that the, I'm sure that it's, it's a number that continues to grow, but over $600 million in terms of grants and funds. and We're almost a billion now. Well, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's incredible, right? So I remember when I was going through it, I was rep re represented by Dennis Gilbert um, back in the day. And it just, there wasn't that second component to it. It was just a business deal. Like, I'm here to negotiate your contract, and that's it. And so um, it's the value-add services of really providing that mentorship because, you know, the only thing that the guys, I'm, I, I used to be one of them, you know, you're coming out, and I got a degree in football, really. I mean, it was political science, but, you know, my head was all about getting into the NFL, and that dream for me came true. I was never a number one player. I was never an elite player at the NFL level, but I was good enough to now be in the club, and I wish I would have had somebody that was pointing the direction, because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, as you know, that if you're a first rounder, plenty of bust, or a 12th rounder, that somehow another, or a seventh rounder now, that makes the team. It's just what are you going to do with your life going forward? Every skill that you used to achieve in athletics is transferable to success later in life because to be a successful athlete, you have to have self-discipline. You have to have an understanding that you may be suffering now and putting work in that's not the most pleasant. For future success, you, you turn down present uh, uh, gratification yeah. for future success. You have to take a, a complex set of information and use it in real time. You have to exhibit a courage and ultimate performance under high pressure. And teamwork is also a key. If you take those skills and apply them to the business world, you'll ultimately be successful. And so... I, I could see the branding opportunity, too, that, that if you're Troy Aikman, you can have Troy Aikman Auto Mall. You can use that brand in virtually anything. So the point was to take young men in a holistic way, look at who they were, all their talents. The first question I'd ask someone is, so if... You could never play football or you got injured. What would you like to do with your life? And so that would be in the first, very first session. So I'd get a sense of where people were. And that's why, um, you know, Bruce Smith, the retired sack master, uh, owns part of the biggest luxury hotel in Washington, D.C., and has a construction uh, company. Mm. It's why uh, Desmond Howard... Um, uh, is a host on College Game Day. Yeah. But it was seeing the totality of the human being and seeing how this could play out and trying to give them a vision based on what their priorities and goals were of what they could ultimately be in the world. Hey, this pod is sponsored by Laird Superfoods. So many products to choose from, from your InstaFuel, your coffee, your tea, your smoothies, 
And I love the superfood creamer and use the hydration powders like the beets, the coconut, the matcha, the turmeric to mix all into my Seven Summit smoothie. And it's so good. Log on to LairdSuperfood.com and get your 20% off when you use the code MARKP20, okay? So get your Laird Superfood, and I guarantee it will help fuel your journey. It must be a lot of fun for you, some satisfaction, gratification of seeing this path that you saw many years ago that where this could ultimately go for everybody. I think the key for me, at least, is is like people ask me, like, you know, Mark, what's what's the secret, right? And and my my answer has been not about the end result, but about really loving the process that you're going through. So funny that you say that, because what I say to athletes all the time is, whether they're in training camp, whether they're in in off-season training, whether they're in season, is stay in process. Keep doing the things necessary to make you successful without obsessing about the long-term results stay in the process and put all your energy into making yourself better but when i started in agentry the the nfl was in a very rudimentary stage teams got two million dollars as their share of the national tv contract seattle and tampa bay in 1976 had a a franchise value when they entered the league of 16 and a half million dollars even in 1995 Carolina and Jacksonville, 130. So I thought that the business was being done in a self-destructive way. Mm -hmm. And I went to owners and said, we're not doing this correctly. Every time we have a negotiation that puts a player into a greedy uh, appearing situation and puts the team into a bad situation, all we're doing is pushing away fans. Uh, Every time we have a collective bargaining agreement that pits billionaires against millionaires, how much empathy do you think that somebody who has a median income of $60,000 is going to have for either party? Yep. So what we need to do is build the brand. Our real challenge here is not labor versus management. It's the fight that the NFL or the NBA or any other sport has. If you're the NFL with the NBA, with Major League Baseball, with uh, home box office, Walt Disney World, every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. And so that's what we're competing for. So our job is to build the brand. So instead of fighting over a tiny pie, if I've got Troy Aikman at Dallas or the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers, let's work harmoniously and think about could we blow out the television contract? Could we induce introduce competition? Because guess where TV's going? They're going to be 300 stations. And could we do stadia that would have multiple ancillary revenue streams that would have jumbo scoreboards and premium seating and and luxury boxes and naming rights could we new use this um, young internet in a way to create brand you know could we do an nfl network and that's where our thinking ought to be so so i changed the traditional perspective which was Uh, this harsh fight between labor and management over Mm -hmm. a finite, tiny little pie. Let's expand the pie and then see where that gets us. And let's stop savaging each other. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting because as a former uh, player and now in the NFLPA, you know, we're we're coming up, I think it's in 2020 when the next collective bargaining agreement is coming around. It's next year. It's next year. And uh, right now they've got this thing, the pre-93ers, who, which you know all about. And essentially, um, our benefits do not equate on the same uh, playing field. And so there's a lot of fight right now in trying to get, you know, at least some of those things, you know, increased. Well, one of the problems, Mark, is millennials believe that history started today. Yeah. And if, if you don't have an understanding of how the National Football League was built on the backs and bodies of older players and and the privilege of inheriting that long legacy, then all of a sudden uh, older players drop off the radar. They're like a second thought. And in reality, um, it uh, they built the sport. 
and they deserve to have pensions and benefits that uh, allow them to live life with dignity and and uh, support. Yeah, well, you should be our, our labor guy then, because you're seeing all the right things, right? And it's trying to get those guys over and across the goal line. I don't know if that's going to happen or not happen, but to me, it's just like if it does, it's a win. It's everything is just it's an up beyond what we have today. We're all hoping, you know, that that's gonna that's gonna happen. I know I just saw this video this morning that came through from um, uh, uh, the running back from uh, the uh, Riggins, um, John Riggins. Yes. His wife is a lawyer, and she's you know really taking this thing on, and uh, and you know we'll see how far this this can go. Again, that is try to get all these you know it's, I think it's a group of four thousand five hundred people, uh, roughly, former players back in the day that built the game to try to get on parity of what the guys do and, and make today. So we'll see. It's a matter of conscience because the reality is that. Part of the danger for athletes is self-absorption, yeah. right? Well, enough about me. Can we talk about how you feel about me? Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> self-absorption. And the key is to <clears throat> have an understanding of your heritage and uh, the fact that I, I did contracts back in the day when players made twelve, fourteen, sixteen thousand dollars for a season. So. The expansion of television is a straw that stirred this drink, and it's television money that has put the ability now for a Russell Wilson to make $35 million a year. Yeah, yeah, incredible. So when you put all these things together for you, and again, if you look kind of at the whole Jerry Guire movie, but you are the guy, you are the agency, right? And you've got other people and some other co-partners at the time. But what year was your pinnacle where, like, you had everything going? You had Troy. You had all these other guys going. And now your reputation, momentum begets momentum. And now you have it, right? I think it was 1984, actually, because um, I had been doing first-rounders. And and I learned early that the quarterback position was uh, the key in football and that that player would have more profile, would get drafted higher than other players uh, who might have higher rating numbers. And since then, it's become a quarterback-centric game. So I had been... um, uh, I had two first rounders in the 1993 draft, uh, excuse me, 83 draft, but I didn't have John Elway. I had uh, Tony Eason and Ken Um. O'Brien, but I had Neil Lomax and Warren and I'd started with quarterbacks. But in 1984, Warren took this tour of the cities and came up with the biggest contract Uh, in NFL history and then a couple weeks later I did Steve Young's contract with the USFL and that was for just like Dr. Evil remember it was for 42 million dollars but it made headlines around the world and so that was a time where an amazing time and so then that comes back around again in 1989 with uh Uh, a string where I uh, did the very first pick in the draft overall six out of those seven years. And so back then it was, um, uh, and I did them in 89, 90, 91. I missed on uh, the Washington defensive end, Steve Entman. And then I did 93, 4, and 5. And they all were first picks. So I would say that life was uh, pretty going pretty well and then I started to write and wrote a book Winning with Integrity which mm-hmm. was a New York Times bestseller and and then Jerry Maguire comes along and Cameron Crowe who was from your area uh, Seattle had just gone underground and he uh, did a book that ended up in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Great movie. I thought it was hilarious. You know, Sean Penn's greatest dramatic role. (laughs) And uh, I thought it was hilarious. And he asked if he could follow me around. So he went everywhere I went. Uh, He went to the NFL League meetings where I had Tim McDonald and was showing him off as a free agent. He went to the draft that year where Bledsoe was the first pick. He went to a press conference with Parcells. He went to USC Scouting Day, came to the Super Bowl, 
came to games with me, sat in my office, and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. Yeah. And then he wrote the script, and uh, I was technical advisor, so my job was to write the script, uh, vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a f motion picture, which it, after all is just lights flickering on a screen. Yeah. Nothing jarred you. Nothing made you feel that dialogue was phony, that look was phony if you're a real sports fan. Yeah. And then he had me work with the actors. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. Yeah. down to the Super Bowl and made him pretend he was a wide receiver for a week. Yeah. I actually had to show Jerry O'Connell who was the quarterback, had to throw a spiral because he had gone to NYU and there was no uh, football there. Yeah. So the film comes out, and it's been 21 years. I don't think I've walked through an airport or been out to dinner very long where someone doesn't run up and say those four words. Yeah, show, show me the money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. show me the money. Well, you also mentioned something earlier uh, that, you know, back in the day where uh, about leverage, I think, was the theme. And you were talking about how, you know, you would you would call up and the owner would just hang up on you. And there was a moment in that in that in the scene where Tom Cruise, who was playing Jerry Maguire, is calling Glenn Fry. He was playing like the general manager or some, you know, role with the Arizona Cardinals, right? And he be like, I don't need this click, right? <laughs> Hangs up the phone. So it goes it goes full circle. So. The the so so your your career is on fire. People in the movie business are coming. You have this movie that blows up. You know you're 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 at a pinnacle in your life. You sell your company, and then and I'm not sure where this happens in the time. But again, we'll go back to the whole theme of this this podcast: finding your summit. People overcome adversity and find their right. way. And a lot of times when you find adversity, it, it's not so much about finding adversity, but it's because you've been on a mountaintop, right? And then somehow or another you tumble down and you fall your, you find yourself in this position like how in the hell did I get here right and 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 I don't know if this was it gets back to the original thing that you were talking about where when you stepped off that plane with Steve Barkowski and there all the lights are flashing and they're out there and you're finding the celebrity and so with celebrity becomes comes a lot of attention with a lot of attention now you're in the bars you're in the restaurants you're in all these people and everybody wants to become your best friend. And so it's very easy to get, you know, in that mode. And since you're entertaining and you're wooing guys, you know, new guys coming in, you run into some personal struggles, right? See, nothing in my business life uh, ever greatly upset me. I walk in every day understanding that unforeseen uh, problems will occur. Um, I don't have to sign every player in the world. Um, and I always bifurcated uh, external uh profile or fame. In other words, I, I never mix it up with my own real life. Yeah. And so I knew better from an early age, from when I was student body president at Berkeley, than to, to get caught up in the fact that there might be an article or I might be on 60, or I was on 60 minutes. That didn't change my need to take the garbage out, mm -hmm. you know, at home or to be a good person. Uh, what happened is that in the, uh, 2000s, a whole series of events happened where my father, who was a rock in my life, yeah. died a long death of cancer. And I felt helpless to, to be able to um, do something about that. I always thought that if I worked harder and was more creative and tenacious, that we ultimately could solve most problems. Um, but I couldn't do anything about that. And then my two boys were stricken with something called retinitis pigmentosa, which is an eye disease mm. that leads them to ultimately be blind and there is no cure. And once again, I felt like, you know, a failure as a father because I couldn't protect them. Then we had a house. Uh, we live in a beachside city. And when El Nino, the big rains here, <laughs> which are not big to anyone else, but the Southern Californians are big. Yeah. Uh, our house got mold, and we had to abandon it in a single day and then knock it down. And then I started to have uh, problems in my marriage. So it was the combination of those things that um, uh, I just at a certain level felt like Gulliver on the beach, tethered down by Lilliputian sticking forks in me, and I lost the sense that I could do the most critical things in life, which were protect my father, protect my kids, protect my uh, marriage, protect 
um, my, a, a home for us to be in. And I turned to alcohol. And uh, since I hadn't been a lifelong heavy drinker, uh, you know, you don't have to have parents who are an alcoholic or have that gene. You can get there just by drinking too much. Yeah. And so I did. And um, ultimately, in the year 2010, I had an epiphany that I had lost uh, any sense of proportionality. And I wasn't a starving peasant in Darfur. I didn't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany, but and I didn't have cancer. I wasn't stricken. What excuse did I have? And so I shut down everything, gave my practice to the younger players, um, uh, younger agents, sh shut down my house, my condo, my business, and went into sober living. And I said, you know, if nothing else in this world, I will be a sober person and I will be a good parent. And so whatever theoretical comeback I've had was in being a good parent and maintaining sobriety. It's yeah. not success in the business world. And so I joined a 12-step program and, and with a unique fellowship and uh, dedicated my life to being sober. And uh, so I'm now in my 10th year of uh, continuous sobriety. And then we reformed uh, an agency in 2014. And, um, and I knew there'd be inevitable questions, you know, how can you guarantee that you'll stay sober? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're getting older in life. How will you be around for our uh, son's career uh you didn't manage your own money really well how are you going to manage you know our sons and i knew there would be all those questions it was up to me to to i don't have a divine right to represent players it was up to me to make connections but i used the same model which is finding role model players and in uh, 2016 we had uh uh, Paxton Lynch uh, mm. as a first-round quarterback, and so that was what I'd always done. And then, and and we kept aggregating players. And uh, I wrote another best-selling book, The Agent, and took a tour because I knew I'd have to reintroduce myself to to a younger generation yeah. because there was like a six, seven-year gap in there where I wasn't representing players. So I went to 85 campuses and, um, and spoke there. I did a nationwide book tour and uh, sort of reconnected. And the good thing is that my real friends were always there. I didn't make it back alone. I made mm -hmm. it with the help of, of all sorts of really generous uh, friends and mentors uh, who stuck by me. And, and here we are. <laughs> Well, listen, it's, it's brave of you, number one, to, to, t to talk about it. Number two is, uh, you know, as I, was, as I was listening to you, this, this, this bump in the road for you, you know, at the end of the day to me, um, and, and, and I was a part of this too, and, you know, my dad died from a massive stroke. And, and as I look back on it now, it was a blessing because it was, it was a three-month ordeal, and my wife didn't want to be married to me anymore. And so I had to go through that, that struggle, and there's been other things. And and, and, and so just like yourself, that little magic word that has to creep into your conscious and only you can figure that out because all your friends can tell you, look, you know, it's, it's not that bad or if you can just do this or do that. But it's really that magical word called perspective. So it was perspective and then it's resilience. Yeah. What, what always has saved me in life is that life will have its reverses. We're all going to be faced with challenges and setbacks. But can you bounce back? Can you see a brighter future? I was raised by really optimistic parents, so I've always felt like uh, life will turn out well. And so if I go into that barn filled with defecation, I'm sure there's a pony in there somewhere. Yeah. And so it's, it's um, uh, understanding that we all have the capacity to be depressed. We have the capacity to, to, to lose hope and the rest of it. But can you bounce back? And, and ultimately, can you go back to your core values, which is that um, uh, there are more battles to fight. We have a, a program against bullying. I've got a Sporting Green Alliance that takes sustainable technology to uh, 
in uh, recycling, resurfacing, uh, solar, water, uh, re, re, uh, that you take to stadiums, arenas, and practice fields to drop carbon emissions and energy costs and to transform those platforms into uh, teaching, educational, so people see how to use the waterless urinal or solar panel and integrate that into their own lives. There are many more battles to be... Uh, 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 and so when Lennox Lewis gets up and does a public service announcement that says, real men don't hit women, yeah. it can do more to permeate the perceptual screen that people put up against authority figures than a thousand authority figures can to deal with domestic violence. Well, I, I think, look, when, when, when you're in the communication field, right, which you are, you're communicating to universities, you're communicating to parents, you're communicating to these foundations, you're communicating at the end of the day to many of these different students who may or may not become a client of yours as they go into the NFL. And I think when, when you're in a position where you can use this little word called me too, um, the, 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 the perspective, um, the, the depths of saying, listen, you're about ready to make a boatload of money, right? Patrick Mahomes, right? Great example, client of yours, right? Yeah. Yes. He's one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL right now. I mean, he's on fire, second year, third year guy. And, 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 and this is a guy, I'm not saying, I don't know anything about Patrick. I'm, he seems like a wonderful person, but it's people that now have gone from nothing to substantial something. And, and now all the pitfalls that can be out there. And I think you can be that great voice out there of saying, you know, I've been there, I understand it, and just uh, just so we're talking about it, so you're, you have awareness, which is always the first thing about anything. So it's just like, wait, I didn't, never saw this thing coming. I think can be a real asset in the, in the way you go and you communicate and you find these different players and really mentor them in where they need to go. So <clears throat> the best thing in athletic behavior is prevention. Right. In other words, it's to understand the dangers of <clears throat> driving when you're drunk, of being in a bar where yeah. uh, you have the potential to get in a fight, in your relationships with women, in your relationships with money, and having you know financial literacy. Um, if you can deal with prevention and stop the problem from ever happening, uh, it's much better than damage control. Yeah. And so. Part of the key is to create an awareness in young men of the microscope effect of that their conduct is viewed through all the time. And so what one would hope, uh, Patrick Mahomes is such an exemplary person with so much self-discipline, and, and he was raised well by his parents, um, so that he's not all about me. He's all about you. He's about his uh, charitable foundation, 15 in the Mahomes, uh, where he helps uh, kids. And so he'll stay grounded. Well, it certainly helps when you have yourself, right, who have already a lot of these core values working for you. And then you, you know, pair it with somebody else who is raised that way. They get it. So you're not having to like, OK, what did I miss now? Right. Um, it can be such a springboard for so many other players to really look up to and say, this is the model, guys, and this is what it can be. So let's make sure that we stay on the right path. And if you start to go off that path, we'll get you the support that you need to make sure you get back on it. Listen, uh, I just want to wrap this whole thing up by saying, uh, again, I'll, and I, I want to end with where I started, which is it's a total privilege and honor for me to be down here in Newport Beach um, I'm so happy for you. Boats to, going boats by. Boats going by. We're sitting here in this beautiful office. Um, you're back on your game. You've got you got players that you can represent, uh, but really more than just the the money part of it. It's just that you can really mentor and and help shape their lives in a positive way. You know, you're almost at a billion dollars when when you when you take the collective efforts of all these different players you've had over time, their contributions in their own communities. I mean, talk about paying it forward, and so. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for coming on and uh, really look forward to to uh, promoting your books on on this podcast. 
and on um, to I everybody else. I have, a new, I have a new one that uh, that's just finishing being written on parenting youth athletes. Yeah. So it's all that's about a big the, one. <laughs> it's all about the culture of yeah. your kid yeah. when he turns five, and <clears throat> do you raise him to be a young Vince Lombardi and win at all costs, or her? Or uh, is participation the key? Yeah. You know, if they're not starting, if they don't like the role they're playing, if the team's losing, do you counsel them to assert themselves to effectuate change? Or should they suck it up and learn character, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I want to change the overbearing father, the single mom that never played sports herself, and, and put together a primer that at least gives you a thought as to – the best way to mentor your kids. I love that. I love that. All right. That is in the works and it's coming. So listen, Lee Steinberg, thank you so much. My pleasure. Hey, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to another amazing episode of Finding Your Summit. Truly incredible people doing spectacular things in life. And I hope you were inspired just like I continue to be. Look, I am super grateful that you came in and subscribed to this pod and would be more than appreciative if you gave the show a ratings and review on iTunes. Trust me, it matters. And then also go share it with your friends, of course. Okay, until next week, go do something great. And remember, it takes a little more to make a champion. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.